church. Hey, let's go ahead and worship the Lord together.
for you guys to go ahead and watch for Valentine's Day. Yeah, I'm pumped. I'm excited. Today I'm going to share with you how I got this dude at my comedy show to do this. We're in Anaheim, I'm doing like uh, five events, and at one of the events, or well, all of the events, I sell merchandise. By the way, if you want some merchandise, there's a link below too. The proceeds are going to this family I know. So I'm at this one in particular show, we finish up, people are buying merchandise, and I sometimes do an autograph line, and I notice this dude standing over to the side, he just holding people's coats and their jackets, and he got all of their stuff. He's just being a really nice dude. While I'm talking to him, I'm like, hey man, who's the cute little girl, is this your daughter? He's like, oh no, that's, that's my girlfriend's daughter. So I'm like, yo, how long you been going out? He was like 10 months. And I could see by looking at this beautiful little girl that she is really attached to this guy, which is dangerous territory. Anyway, I know this is gonna be weird for some people because I don't even know this dude's first name yet, but I feel like I'm supposed to challenge him. So I pull him to the side and I say, hey man, I understand kids and that little girl in her eyes you are her dad. I think you need to step up and marry this little girl's mom or get out the way so for wh whoever her husband is, he could show up. Dude looks at me kind of startled and he said, I want to marry her. I just don't know what to do. I was like, I got another show. You got a ring? <laughs> so I'm sitting with my team and we're kind of cultivating the plan because it, it could get messed up like it like it's happened before. You truly make me the happiest person on earth. But I don't want to get too far into this without knowing for sure if Jamie is still on board or not. I just wanted to make sure you're making a decision based off of just uh, how, you how you feel like it should happen. So yeah, I'm nervous. I feel like I want to throw up, but I think that's how I'm supposed to feel. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he feel like, but he love her though. But he's still like, blah, blah. Hey, what is this? What is it? Now, when you come up with a plan like this, you got to make the audience be thinking in one direction, and then when you change that direction in a way they're not expecting, boom, it's the biggest impact. Now, I'm excited about the marriage. I'm excited about the proposal, but at the same time, there's like 2,000 people here. So I want to make sure everybody's getting what they want. We're going to set it up so she has no idea. I can't really pull you, pull you away from her during the show, because then it'll, it'll make her think that there's something sneaky going on. Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to have probably three couples come up on stage. Why am I bringing up three decoy couples? Well, actually, it's just two decoy couples and then the real couple. Let me explain. At a comedy show, on a stage with a microphone, if you bring a couple up and people know their girlfriend and boyfriend, everybody will jump the punchline. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring all three couples up then that way, nobody has any idea what's going on, including Allison. Uh, today, I met like three couples that just- But here's the thing, before we get to that, I need you to subscribe. Yeah, I'm not gonna finish the story. Thank you. Three couples that just stood out for me. They told me their story. I was so touched by their story. They probably aren't even fully aware of this, but I would love it. I, I know that they're here because I got them some tickets and I put them in a, like a certain section. All right, here's how we're gonna use these decoy couples. I'm putting the audience under the impression that I'm just bringing them up because they were at a different show and they were moved by it. Because again, at my shows, there's funny, but the name of my recent tour is called More Than Funny. So I wanna talk to these couples and see how they might've been inspired or whatever. But what I'm really doing is I'm creating a pattern in the audience's mind, also in Allison's mind, on how this works. So first thing I do is I talk to the woman, right? And, and then I talk to the guy. Is there anything you want to say to your wife. Establish that with couple number one. Move to couple number two, talk to the lady, and then say to the guy again, is there anything you want to say to her? Boom, he says what he has to say. The pattern is set in the audience mind, 
but more so in Alice's mind as well. Now, it's time to talk to the real folks. You guys are cold here. All right, cool. Beautiful. So, um, so here's the thing. I clearly told Jamie we're going to have three couples up. Couples mean two. Jamie brings up the little girl. What is the little girl doing on stage? I don't understand. The plan was clear. You're not a truple. It's a couple, not a truple. Don't get me wrong. I love kids. In fact, I used to be one. Kids are unpredictable. You don't know what they're going to do, how they're going to respond. <sighs> so what did, you, what did you think about the message today? He's hard to receive. He doesn't receive things well, but the message that you gave him just shook him and the way he received it had an impact on me. So it helped me receive. So at this point, I can clearly tell by the look in Allison's eyes, she has no idea what's going on. I'm also doing the math on the audience and they don't have a clue either. Now, the question is, because Jamie is still looking a little nervous, is he gonna follow the instructions? Our biggest punchline, our truest punchline is for that brother to bend the knee and drop down. So with regards to the message and what we talked about, is there anything that you wanted to say to her? Yeah. Can I marry you and your mom? Mm hmm Can I be your daddy forever? Uh-huh. Can you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> Boom. What? 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 That's what I'm saying. That is what I'm saying. For clarity, I'm the one who told him that he should bring a little girl. It was, it was my idea. I just... Yeah, so, dude, here's what was dope. The fact that you turned to her is so awesome. And, and that is just huge, dude. You are already a phenomenal dad. You've got to recognize that. You've got to recognize that. Yo, one of the things I enjoy most about this story is the fact that Jamie, admitting that he was fearful, he didn't know exactly what it was going to look like, decided to step up and do what he knew was right. He decided, yep, I'm going to be a husband and I'm going to be a father to some people who really need me and I care for. I have a heart for fathers and even kids who don't necessarily have a father like one around. Fellas, in what area, in what relationships are you in right now that you're not stepping up and being fully committed? And what can you do to turn that around? How you wanna live? You wanna live with fear or you wanna live bigger? You wanna step out there and get it done. I'm out. Don't forget to subscribe. Okay, so you know um, those other two couples was just a decoy. You know that, right? <laughs> yeah. So here is what you don't know is you got a group of family members who are here. <laughs> you didn't even know. Where you guys at? There they go. There's people way in the back. We actually, <laughs> listen, we, we actually stored them back there so you wouldn't see them because you would have got suspicious. Well, how about that? Who ever thought I'd have to follow Michael Jr.? Welcome Sunday night. It's good to be with you and uh, what crazy times we're in. Who would have thought that we would have been invited into your living room for Valentine's Day? As Pastor Rich and Matthew, we had such a, an exciting plan for what we had planned for meals, but uh, we're, we're hoping that you're joining us, that you're in the comforts and the warmth of your home, regardless of what might be going on outside. And uh, we're going to go through a few announcements, not much, and then we're going to get right into a, to a marriage message that I prepared for tonight, and uh, it's so fun to talk about my most favorite topic, as you know. So, uh, so we're going to have you sit back, hopefully you have your refreshments and your food, and enjoy this evening that we've planned originally to have you with us. So a couple announcements, if you get out your... Smart devices, if you have those, it, and look at our app at calvaryhillsboro.org. Uh, we're going to start tonight with uh, one serving opportunity. We've been talking about it as we've ramped up. Um, you know, many things keep changing. Pastor Rich continues to send out messages on the app or, of course, instructions about what happened this weekend. 
And, uh, but our serving opportunity is children's ministries. And uh, as you know, we've started adding our classes back through fifth grade. And uh, as more and more families are signing up, more and more kids are coming, and uh, we are in need of ramping up our ministry leaders. And so we invite you, if you're looking for an opportunity to serve, this is just an amazing, amazing influence on our body to take care of these children and minister to them. We invite you to participate. Many opportunities available, as you see on the screen, different ages, different classes, no experience needed. We will train you. Uh, just need you to sign up so we can do a background check and have you get in touch, and, and our children's ministries directory will get in touch with you. So we, we hope that you'll prayerfully consider that so we can continue to add uh, helpers and teachers to our classrooms. The, we don't have any highlighted events, as you can imagine. There's, uh, things are a little different this week. No highlighted events to announce uh, coming up, so we'll be working on those this, next week as a staff. We'll keep you posted on anything new that happens or it's coming up in the church. So the last thing I just want to mention is, that, of course, we're not taking an offering, even if you were here, and uh, we thank you so much for st staying with us this past year, and on your app, there's easy access to online options that you can use to uh, to take care of any giving that you would like to be blessing us with. And we just thank you so much for that, so much. It's been a crazy year. So I am excited to open us in prayer and pray God's blessing over our time together as we talk about his wonderful design for marriage. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, really, Lord, just your goodness, uh, the opportunity we have, the technology we have to continue to uh, press on and uh, present the word, to talk about your goodness, to talk about your grace tonight in marriage. Lord, we are thankful for what you have for us. I pray that ears would hear what you have to say in relationships among our people, and that it would be an encouragement to those that are married to those who are thinking about marriage, the many that we know that are engaged, even those who are influencers in their families, among young adults, grandparents, and adults who are working on continuing to minister to their adult family members and encourage them with the gospel related to marriage. So we thank you so much, Lord, in Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, the title of my message this evening is Marriage Shaped by Grace. Marriage Shaped by Grace. Now, if I were to ask you if to scan the entire human vocabulary and come up with the most powerful word you can for marriage, many, many of you would automatically say love. Now, I wouldn't be able to disagree with that, not at all. But those of you that know me well and know my heart for marriage, Know it's the passion that we have in ministry to reach out to families and encourage God's best among you. You know and won't be surprised that I chose the word grace. I chose the word grace. Why is that? Well, we all need it. We all need it in marriage. You can't live without it, but you can't purchase it. You can't earn it. It only ever comes by means of a gift, by means of a gift. And when you receive it, you immediately realize how much you needed it all along. In a fallen world, populated by selfish, lost, fearful, rebellious people, it's the only thing that everyone needs. And you can only give to what you have. You can only give it to someone after you first have it because you just can't give away something which you don't already have yourselves. So you see, God's grace is a powerful force in our relationships. It teaches you where you are and takes you where God wants you to be. And I'm speaking tonight of personal testimony, and I'll give examples of that, no different than you are. It has the power, grace does, to do something that nothing else can do for you, to transform your marriage at the core of who you are as a human being, 
your heart, to transform your heart. Marriage shaped by grace is the topic. I too confess to you that I continue to work at God's best in my marriage, at God's design for my marriage. It takes work. It never stops. It's full of many blessings. So I thought maybe the best way to start out this topic would be to begin the conversation with a little bit about my story. Sherry and I have been married almost 39 years. We've been 39 years in May. It still amazes us. Still amazes us. Yes, yes, I think we were probably married at age 12, some of you might say. We would hope you would say. But no, seriously, early in our marriage, I was a very impatient person, a very impatient person. And a matter of fact, in our premarital counseling, yes, we went through premarital counseling just like we offer here. And when we went through that, our college pastor looked at Sherry one session and said something like this, your soon-to-be husband is competitive and driven by college baseball here on campus. But his personality tends to make him a candidate to lash out in anger. Ooh, that kind of hurt. I don't know where that came from. Some survey I filled out, some answer I had given him, some conversation we'd had about life in our sessions. And he said to her, you should know this. And be prepared for it. Be prepared for it. How was God going to prepare her for that possibility of something I didn't even realize someone else might see in my character? Well, just having him point that out, we were 21 years old. It kind of shocked me. And just having him point that out, I, I simply wanted to please God. I'd only been a believer at that time for about three years, and I I was just so hungry to do the right thing. I just wanted to please God. And you know, by his grace, truly by his grace, it never became an issue in our marriage, not one time. Now, I didn't say it wasn't an issue for me. It just wasn't an issue in our marriage. I still had much work to do. So we chose, Sherry and I, we chose to run to the cross in the midst of difficult times and conflict. And we made that choice when we were young in our marriage to give grace to each other, not to run away looking to blame or to have conflict. It was a great lesson. It was wonderful insight. It was a good decision on our part to choose to please God. What was the result? significantly less conflict in our home all these many years, significantly less conflict. You ask my grown children about it, most of them would look at you and say, I don't know that I can remember. I just don't remember when mom and dad had any kind of significant conflict. Now, they'll remember the difficulties that they brought us, challenging parenting times, but Sherry and I always believed that God blessed us with a big family because he knew we had the energy to pour into those kids because we weren't spending that energy in a negative way on each other. So accountability on a topic such as anger early on helped me trust God with it. So let me encourage you as we get started into this material tonight. Let me encourage you to make choice, husbands and wives, as you listen, because the temptation No different than in my counseling office. The temptation is to hear a principle and look to your right or left and think, he's speaking to you, husband. He's speaking to you, wife. But let me encourage you this way. I'm going to ask you to fire your inner advocate. What in the world does that mean? We all have these whispers of entitlement, defensiveness, selfishness that we walk around with, and when we are offended in some way, our inner advocate tells us it's not our fault. So I need you to let that go tonight. Wives, I need you to stop listening to this message for your husband. Stop listening to this message for your husband. Ladies, please, please listen to it for you. And husbands, you're not off the hook either now. Don't sit there and listen for your wife. Don't sit there and listen for something you can point out to her. Did you hear what Pastor Sean said? Something that was perfect for you to work on. Men, listen 
for yourself and watch what God will do in your life, in your marriage. Choose, as we did early on, to please God in your marriage. Choose to please him. Now, I chose to please him on that potential issue of anger. Otherwise, there would no doubt have been all kinds of conflicts that we never lived through. Now, I, what I do believe is I've been in ministry for many years now, many years sitting with couples in all different places of their walk of faith, all different places of their relationships to one another and their relationships to God. And I believe there are thousands of couples, thousands of couples who get married every year with unrealistic expectations. Maybe it's our culture of dating. I think our culture, our Western culture of dating encourages couples to put aside all those things that they are offended by. Put aside those difficult things. Keep the environment at paradise level. Enjoy it, enjoy it, enjoy it until the day of the marriage, and it'll just continue. I think it sets us up, thousands of couples up, for disappointment. Why are our expectations unrealistic? Why? Well, I suggest to you, as we will entertain many scriptures, you'll notice the topic that we have is not found in any one passage. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. But in this particular case, I'd like to share Galatians 5, 17. It says, for the desire of the flesh is against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. How about that? We talk a lot about the spirit within us speaking to us. Do we take seriously as we move into marriage what the Bible says about us and our world? Do we take that seriously? Somehow, I think many think that we have enough love in our relationship to cut through these problems, to cut through them and see all around that we see all around us. Other people have those problems. We're not going to have those problems. We deny it. Here's an illustration, a true premarital counseling illustration. A young lady once sitting in front of me said these famous words, I don't think I could ever be angry with him. <laughs> you know, I, I almost got angry just listening to it, but I had to smile. Of course I had to smile. It sounds beautiful, doesn't it? But it's delusional. It's delusional. It won't lead you to a good place. It's an unbiblical view of the world that we live in to think that you would never be upset with your spouse. Don't start the relationship by closing your eyes to what is true about our every relationship, not wanting to hear or see or examine for fear that it might mess things up. 1 Corinthians 14, 20 offers this. Brothers and sisters, do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. Oh, how we all need reminded of that in our dating and courting days. Here's a gospel principle for you. Good news always follows accepting bad news. Let me repeat that. Good news always follows accepting bad news. What do I mean by that? If you don't accept the bad news God says about our sinful nature, about who we are in this world that we're in, if you don't accept that news about the world we live in, you'll miss God's grace in your marriage. You'll miss his grace. Good news in marriage is rooted in accepting the bad news of who we really are within our sinful nature. If you act like there's no bad news, if you say to one another, we got this, when, when you say that, there's no, there, there's no one thing in your marriage that you don't need. All of a sudden, you're telling each other, we don't need a savior. We don't have bad news. We don't have to address that. We got this. Grace. I love Psalm 112, six and seven, that says, for he will never be shaken 
The righteous will be remembered forever. He will not fear bad news. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Grace. If you tell yourself, as I just said, we got this. You're not recognizing the sinful nature that comes with the package of marriage. You signed up for it. It's who we are. Thinking that you have a, have a fix for all these things, you will be quite disappointed. Today, some of you are still shocked with things you are facing, that you are still surprised by what you're going through in your life together. Maybe you're denying Maybe you're denying what God says about us in our world. He has much to say. Compounded by, we tend to use, all of us, when we look at marriage, we tend to use the Bible in error on this topic. Why do I say that? Well, notice that the Bible's not arranged by topic. It's not arranged by topic. I call that divine intention. It's not designed that way. It's a grand, redemptive story. God's notes to us. God's notes to us. If all you do, and I find many of us, many couples do this, if all you do to understand your marriage biblically is to go to the marriage passages, you will miss all the building blocks about human relationships. Basically, every, pack, every passage I read tells me something about myself, something about God, something about life in a fallen world. It tells me all these things. 1 John chapter 2, listen to these words, verses 15 to 17. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God continues to live forever. Just like I said above, Every passage tells us something about life. That's why we miss so much when we just simply search the scriptures on marriage or search husbands or search wives. We need to take into account all of the scriptures to understand the grace that God offers us in life. I love marriage. I love marriage and I care about you. I care about your marriages. I care about your upcoming marriages. I care about your older children who are thinking about getting married. I think about these things constantly in my own marriage. Now, there are people here listening, people listening from all over the place, all over this country of ours. We have people logging in from time to time to listen to our services. We've been immensely blessed by the reach of our online ministry, and we welcome all of you this evening, but there are many listening who need to understand this message so that you can find a fresh way that God and his son helps you in your marriage. It is a fresh outlook on the challenges you have to look at them through the lens of grace, God's grace. The Bible allows us to function with God's preparation. You are not sovereign. I am not sovereign over my own world. You didn't know what was going to happen to you last year. My goodness, who would have thought what we've all been through in 2020? None of us knew what was going to happen, or even last week. We're communicating right now, and we really, none of us know what could even yet happen to some of us yet tonight. We don't know. We don't have sovereignty over our world. Yet the Bible tells us things that help us to be prepared to help us be prepared for what we don't know is coming. Isn't that a wonderful thing? It helps us. God is always giving us information, but you need to be in it and read it. Speak with him. Practice his plan in your marriage. So when they come, the Bible has warned 
me with wisdom and insights when these things come, these unexpected things. We should not be unprepared, any of us. Matthew 24, 44 says, for this reason you must be ready as well. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. The Son of Man is coming. Be prepared. Now I'd like to offer you three things. You know I love lists. And I'd like to offer you three things that you need to have to embrace in your marriage. Three things. Number one, marriage is located in a broken world. No surprise to any of us. It's not functioning the way God intended in this world of ours. Romans 8.22, I love 8.22. It says, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. When do we groan? When do we groan in our marriages? Maybe when we're weary, when we're in pain, when circumstances are outside of our control, we groan. Doesn't take place in a predictable way, our marriages. Most things are not predictable. That's not the world we live in. God wants us to be prepared. Our broken world makes itself known to us, pressing in on our marriages all the time. It intrudes every week. Here's a few examples of how that happens. How about some of us now have virtual bosses? Many of you are working from home. Some of you are going in, but your bosses aren't necessarily there. So many bosses are virtual. They're making decisions, and all of a sudden, you have no job. We've seen it in our nation this past year. No job. You come home as a husband and tell your wife you lost your job. Don't tell me that doesn't put pressure on a marriage. As blessed as my corporate and business life has been in, in my life, my career, I have been through this emotional experience multiple times. Don't tell me. It doesn't put pressure on your marriage. Or maybe it's a physical sickness for you or your family. We certainly have seen that all over the nation this year. Even the things that were, we were used to seeing now compounded by a pandemic that has taken many lives. Maybe it's a physical sickness. It creates an unknown, unknown future in your home for a loved one. Or maybe a spouse creates pain, hard to focus on your spouse when you're going through such pain and illness. Hard to have unity and community. Hard to have it when you just literally don't feel like it. Don't tell me that doesn't impact a marriage. Don't tell me. And how about this example? Maybe it's the shocking and sad rebellion of one of your children. Some of us have been there, some more than we want. But maybe it's that sweet little one that you just can remember holding. And they grow up and become a bit older. And all of a sudden, they can't wait to be out of your house. And they say things that are hurtful, disrespectful. Mom or dad, you can't make me do anything. Don't tell me that doesn't put pressure on a marriage. Don't tell me it doesn't rob your home of peace. So we need to be girded up. We need to understand how God's grace is a tool in our homes, in our marriages, to strengthen our marriages. We're going to spend the rest of our time discussing that. Why is God so honest about the condition of this world? Why? Well, I suggest to you it's because he loves you. He loves us. He wants you to be prepared. Your marriage is located in this moment. Grasp his plan. He wants to do things for us, but we, he has to get us in a place where we're more teachable. He can get us there, but not with pride, not with defensiveness in our homes, not with an attitude of, please fix my spouse. How's he going to work with that? If only he or she would understand what I need is some of the dialogue that goes on in our homes. How is our fallen world encroaching your marriage? How is it pressing into your marriage. Our culture puts wrong heroes in front of us. Here's one, material success. 
is often portrayed as the only success. Instead of invest instead in your marriage instead of stuff. Invest in your marriage instead of stuff. If this fallen world is pulling you away from your spouse, in what way are you struggling most? Remember, men, hear this for yourself. Ladies, for yourself, not for each other. Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You have to embrace these things in your marriage. Number two, Embrace. The Bible says you are a sinner, married to a sinner. We've often heard it. Two sinners in a fallen world living together in marriage. But pastor, haven't we been redeemed? Well, yes, we have. But the presence of sin still lives in us. Presence still lives in us. It's very important to understand and accept that. Wives, wives, hear me. Your husbands will lose their way. He will say unloving things. He'll do things that you object to. He won't always make good choices. He may say something that's unloving. He is not yet fully formed in the image of God, is he? He is not yet formed in the image of God. Now, my dear wife, Sherry, tells women under her counsel often when these topics come up, she says to the wives, you know, there's only one perfect man and you know you did not get him. You did not get that one perfect man. So why do these things so surprise us in our marriages? Husbands, I don't need to tell you that you didn't marry a perfect woman. Our wives are less than perfect. She'll have a bad day. She'll say some wrong things. Your feelings will get hurt because she is also not fully formed in the image of God. The longer you are married, the more in tune you both will be with your failures, each of your failures, your sin, your temptations. And when that happens, you will either do what I call rejecting, condemning, self-righteous things or you will be prepared as God wants us to be prepared, not to be surprised. And you'll have a much more appropriate response. So I call this great, God's great model for grace in marriage. God's model for grace in marriage. Husbands and wives, not, when, not if, but when, not if, but when your eyes ever see or your ears hear sin and failure of your spouse. It's never an accident. It's never an interruption. It should never be a hassle. It's always God's grace. It's always God's grace. God loves this person. He put in your marriage with you. A marriage of faith so you can be his tool, God's tool to the other one to help rescue that person with grace. Not criticism, grace. Being married is signing on to this as an instrument of God's grace. You signed on to this, to be an instrument of God's grace to your spouse, hear me, who has not yet graduated with a degree in grace. We are just going to fall short, and God will build you each up if you operate under his plan. I love these next two verses, Hebrews 4.16 Therefore, let's approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace for help at the time of our need. And John 1.16, for of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, grace upon grace. Now, here's my concern. When I talk to couples about grace, I talk to them about to you tonight about the concept of showing grace in the midst of a storm. My concern is that when we do that, husbands and wives often hear, be easy on wrong. Be easy on wrong. 
Just let it go. Permit it. Be permissive. Absolutely not. Listen, grace never calls wrong right. Never calls wrong right. If it did, there wouldn't be a need for grace. God does not compromise his redeeming law. The whole purpose of the cross. Grace never calls wrong right. Grace is a way of dealing with the wrong. It's a way of dealing with the wrong. A way most of us could work harder on. You want to transform your moment of conflict and disappointment in your marriage at some moment in time? Think this way. What is God revealing to me? Why is he allowing this to happen? What is he trying to do right now in my marriage? Ephesians 4.32 is insightful here. Be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Or James 4.6, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, some of you, your response to these conflicts is what? You become immediately mad when God is showing you weakness, failure, and sin through your spouse. You never acted that way when we were dating. Might be some of the words that are said. I never thought my husband would ever say that to me. I've heard in my counseling room. Why not? My response is, why not? We are all sinners. Why would you be shocked by that? Take seriously what the Bible says about grace in our marriages. I want to encourage you to take seriously that because we are all still broken, still a work in process, still being transformed. We are all still in need of being rescued. God's tool in marriage is to help accomplish this, grace. So either you get mad and condemn your spouse or you get on board with God's plan. Be his tool. Can you do that? Can you look at this through a different lens and imagine the freedom you would feel in the midst of conflict to support one another, search for God's best? You will not avoid in marriage the discovery of sin or weakness or failure in your spouse. You will not. What does this all mean to us? Just like you, I search these lessons for nuggets that can help me build my marriage based on where it is right now. There's a deep longing for marriage paradise among our people everywhere. Everybody's getting married often, often for happiness, not necessarily simply to serve the Lord. That, however, is an eternal destination, paradise. Marriage is part of the preparation. It's part of the preparation to reach that paradise to come. Marriage is where all of your unpreparedness is exposed. (laughs) Our neediness exposed. It's God's plan so we, in real time, can give his grace to one another. We are his tool in marriage. It moves us along. So I see it as never an accident, never a hassle when things come up, always an opportunity for grace. God has put that person in your life, that very, very special person in your life, so he can expose to you their sinful needs so you can be his tool and help rescue the marriage. Are you willing to be that person? Are you? Colossians 4, 6 says, your speech must always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each other. Wives, I say this in love, wives, don't be mad at me. How many times, how many times last week when you saw the weakness and sinful nature of, the, of your man, did you say instead, this is not a hassle, this is my calling. I've been called by God right now to be bigger than my own happiness, and I'm going to minister to my husband with grace. Help him see God's best. Husbands, how many times in the last month, 
How many times when the weaknesses of your spouse were divinely brought to your attention, did you say, this is my calling? Or did you say or think something unloving or critical? Remember, husbands, hear this message for yourself, not for your wife. Four quick things to share with you. Things that if you don't take seriously what the Bible says about the continuing presence of sin and the need for grace. Some of you will be able to relate to these as in your parenting skills. Things that you've encountered with your kids. Number one, you will turn moments of ministry into moments of anger. How many of you have done that? Just simply lost it with your kids. The opportunity to teach a lesson, a life lesson has been lost now on the anger. You will not see his intention and lash out inappropriately what God's trying to do in that, that particular moment. Number two, you will personalize what is not personal. You will make it about you. That's not what God wants. Like, I can't believe you just said that. I can't believe that you did that without me. I can't believe you told our friends that. Your whole response will be about you. Please don't do that. Don't personalize something God used to bring grace and redemption to your spouse. Little things become war when that happens. And we all regret this one. Number three, don't be adversarial in your response. What's that mean? You strike back. The beautiful presence of God's grace, his rescuing grace, his revealing grace is completely missed in that particular moment. No wonder many of you get discouraged. And number four, don't settle for quick solutions that don't get to the heart of the matter. Like, forget it. I don't want to talk about it. Sometimes followed by silence. Now, no knife involved, but silence can be awful for a spouse. I'll just ignore them until I'm feeling better. None of that does what? It never leads to change. It just deepens distance and hurt. It's sad because we do not take seriously what the Bible says about who we are, about our sin. We should be more prepared. And finally, a third thing you must carry into your marriage. We mentioned marriage is located in a broken world. The Bible says you are a sinner married to a sinner. And lastly, you are blessed with a redeemer who is powerful, faithful, willing. Wow. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. What a powerful, powerful verse. Wives, please embrace the fact that you don't have the power personally to change your husband. Your redeemer does. God does. Be his tool. Show grace. Let him change your husband. Husbands, you have no ability to personally change your wife. But God does. God does. He willingly unleashes his power on us, his grace. Our daily lives are about those little moments, not the big moments, not the grand moments. God's concerned about our little details of our life. What is happening in those moments? How much is God's grace being revealed by the way you respond to one another? Are you doing better than a year ago? Five ago? Ten ago? We should be growing in this area. Are you doing better? Is it ministry or is it about the hurt and anger and disappointment and the desire for it to be better? Oh, the Lord is waiting on us, so many of us, husbands and wives, to let him come into your living rooms and show his grace in the midst of our conflicts. Jesus offers you all that's necessary to have a deeper relationship and love for one another. Sherry and I made that choice at age 21 to run to the cross, to run to the cross, to ask him for wisdom, to teach us. And oh, I'm so glad we did because we built on that over the many, many years of our life. 
perfect, far from it. Challenges, many. Life surprises came our way more than we would have ever planned, but we had Jesus Christ in the middle of our home each time demonstrating his grace so we could be his tool in marriage. Some of you have allowed the disappointment of sin to hammer your marriage. And I'm just here to say tonight to pray that he would remove that from you. Oh, what a blessing it would be if you feel like the sin that you see in each other is hammering your marriage. If you could replace those conversations with God's grace, help each other, draw closer to him. We can do better. All of us can do better. Amen? We can all do better. Ask God to help you surrender your plan and run to the abundant grace he has for each of you. That's my prayer for you. It would change our nation. It would change our city to see healthy, more healthy marriages. Praying for you. Let's pray now together. Heavenly Father, it's a tall order to raise the bar and to lay at your feet some of the habits we have in our homes for how we speak to one another, how we think about the things that we don't like that's in our lives, the sin that should not be a surprise to us. We are all yet sinners. So Lord, we are so thankful as we close this service for your son. So thankful for your redeeming blood on the cross. So thankful for your word, which outlines for us over and over and over the grace that you want to pour out on us. Open our eyes. Help us to see these conflicts in our marriages as opportunities to be your tool of grace. Oh, what a different way to look at conflict. So I pray that the many couples that are listening, who are in touch with us in ministry, would reflect on this and see a new opportunity to transform their thinking about challenges and about sin that we see in each other's lives and that we turn it around and we thank you for showing us and giving us the opportunity to pour grace on each other and watch the changes happen, supernatural changes happen in our homes. Father, thank you so much for your word and for this message. Pray for all our folks who are home. And we just give you glory for it as we enter into worship, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless all of you. Have a great evening. You came to the world you created, trading your You willingly died, and innocent blood paid the call. Counting your status as nothing, the king of all kings came to serve. Washing my feet, covering. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. 
love you so much. We submit ourselves to you humbly. Say, come and magnify yourself through our life. Amen. It's been a joy to worship alongside you, church. Have a great rest of your weekend.